Hello folks, welcome back. Mr. Vass here. This is a mini lesson, connection between derivatives and limits. Uh, this is in our chapter two, which is about derivatives. And this is being done by special request for my third period AP calculus class, specifically team number two. Okay, so let's get after it. Uh, the top of the page, we've got two different, uh, two different limit statements. The top one, is the definition of the derivative f prime of x is the limit of the difference quotient as h goes to zero we've seen that since section 2.1 and then we learned later in the chapter that hey there's a bunch of shortcuts and you don't have to do that limit definition of the derivative every time you want to know a derivative uh, the second one here is the derivative at a point it's an alternative form of that limit statement so uh, notice here that there's f prime of x whoops trying to do a highlighter that's not a highlighter we got f prime of x and f prime of c okay so f prime of x is the instantaneous rate of change of the function at any point we're interested in but f prime of c is the instantaneous rate of change at a specific x value okay so that's like if you need the slope of a tangent line when x equals one you would find f prime of one okay so enough about that Let's go ahead and get rid of that stuff. And then uh, I, I want to add something to the page here. I'm going to take this limit statement and everywhere I see x, I'm going to put in the value c. So it's going to look like this. Okay, and what we have now is a second form for derivative at a point. Okay, so notice we have two different forms now for f prime of c. Uh, so we get, uh, the, what I'm about to go through is some examples where we have to kind of decode a limit statement and figure out which of these three models, model number one, model number two, or model number three, which of these three models it fits into. And every statement uh, that's given, or every limit statement, is going to look like the right-hand side of these models, one of the right-hand sides, okay? And then what we're going to do is we're going to use the shortcuts we know to determine the left-hand side. And that's really what this is about. It's about matching a limit statement to one of the models and using the shortcuts we know about derivatives to actually evaluate the limit statement. So yes, we are determining limits, but we're not actually doing all the stuff we learned in Chapter 1 about limits. Okay, so let's get after it with this first one. So when I look at this limit statement it looks a lot like model number three and the reason why it looks like model number three is because I have an H in the denominator let's try a highlighter I have an H in the denominator I'm interested in the limit as H goes to zero I have no X's anywhere in the limit statement you'll see right there there, there are no X's there is only C values and H's so that's why I'm going to choose model number three. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to rewrite that model right below this limit statement. Okay, so there's the model. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to match up pieces parts. Okay, so I've got, struggling to select the highlighter. I got sine of pi over three here, and that matches up with this. I've got sine of pi over 3 plus h, which matches up with this. And then obviously I got the h in the denominator that matches up with this. Okay, so what that means for us is that this limit statement is equal to f prime of c if c is equal to pi over 3 and f is equal to sine. Okay, again, I'm just matching up the pieces. Okay, so I've got sine goes with f, pi over 3 goes with c, pi over 3 also goes with c, and then I got h there in the numerator, and then there's another h in the denominator. So I'm matching up those pieces parts. So at this point, I'm going to just forget about everything involved in looking at that limit statement because now I'm going to use shortcuts okay so if I'm interested in f prime of c I first need to find f prime of x 
f prime of x. Now let's see, derivative sine, that's cosine. Okay, so that's done. Uh, now f prime of c, if c is pi over 2, that means I need to do f prime of pi over 2, which is going to be the cosine of pi over 2. Folks, I've been saying pi over 2 for the last five minutes, and then I'm just not even looking closely enough at my own example. That should be pi over 3. So let's fix that right now. Perfect. Okay. And the cosine of pi over 3, well, if you need to sketch out the unit circle, do that for yourself. Pi over 3 is up here. Cosine is the x-coordinate. That appears to be 1 half. So if you're evaluating this limit, your answer is 1 half. Okay, let's look at the second one. I got the limit of x plus h quantity squared plus 3 times x plus h minus quantity x squared minus 3x all over h. Well, that one looks like our traditional uh, limit definition of the derivative, so that, that matches up nicely with the, the, the model number 1. So I'm just going to write that over here below it, f prime of x is equal to the limit as h goes to 0 of f of x plus h quantity squared minus f of x all divided by h. Now that your challenge is to figure out what f is, okay, because this is just, we have to take a derivative. Okay, so what is f here? I'm going to rewrite this and see what, if I can maybe make heads or tails of this. So uh, the x plus h quantity squared, I'm going to keep, plus 3 times the quantity x plus h, I'm going to keep, and then I'm going to do a, something here that's a little different than what was originally given in the problem. I'm going to factor out a negative sign, and I'm going to write this as x squared plus 3x. Okay, so now let's go back and match this up with our model. Right here, that's f of x. And if this is just equal, this is going to be equal to f prime of x if f of x is equal to x squared plus 3x. So that's just, you know, that's pretty straightforward. We're just going to use our shortcut for the power rule, struggling to get my screen to drag. There we go. So f prime of x is just going to be 2x plus 3. And that's the answer to this limit question. All right, one more example. So what we got to do is play the matching game and figure out which of the models this one looks like. So I'm going to scroll back to the top of the page. And this one looks like this model to me. Okay, so I'm going to write that one below the problem. Okay, so this is going to be equal to f prime of c, which is the limit as x approaches c. Why did I pick that model? Because there's no h in it. And then this is going to be f of x minus f of c, all divided by x minus c. Okay, so that means that this limit expression is equal to f prime of c if c is equal to something and f of x is equal to something. Let's see if we can figure out what those things equal. Okay, so it looks like that right there is going to be f prime of c. That is going to be c. And that is going to be f of x. Okay, why did I uh, draw the arrow from 8 to f of c? Because that's where it fits in the model. And now I could check that, right? It, it certainly looks like the model here, uh, the, the function is going to be x cubed. Uh, but c is equal to 2, and I guess i got to kind of check myself. Is 2 cubed equal to 8? Yeah, it sure is. 2 times 2 times 2 is 8. So we're in good shape. So now I just need to find, if I'm looking for f prime of c, which is what this limit equals, first thing I'm going to do is use my shortcuts to find f prime of x. And now I'm going to find f prime of c by substituting in c equals 2 into that f prime function. 2 squared is 4, 3 times 4 is 12. There you go. That's the answer for that one. Folks, we got one more here. Let's take a look at it. I got the limit as x approaches negative 1 of the cube root of x plus 1 
all divided by the quantity x plus 1. So again, this one, I don't see a, an h in it anywhere. So this one appears that it's going to be f prime of c is equal to the limit as x approaches c of f of x minus f of c all divided by x minus c. Now let's match up the pieces parts. Cube root of x, that's the function. Notice here it's plus 1 in the numerator. Maybe I should rewrite that. The limit as x approaches negative 1 of x to the 1 third power minus negative 1 all divided by x minus negative 1. So why did I rewrite it like that? So that I can see that the c value is actually negative 1. Okay, so this limit is going to be equal to f prime of c if c is equal to negative 1 and f of x is equal to the cube root of x or x to the one-third power. So if we want to know what f prime of c is, we first need f prime of x. That's going to be one-third times x to the negative two-thirds. Okay, so there's my, my derivative using the power rule. Uh, let's rewrite that because uh, I don't like negative exponents. They're hard for me to see where denominators are. Uh, so this is going to be 1 over 3 times x to the 2 thirds power. And remember what x to the 2 thirds power is equal to. Well, first of all, negative exponent means reciprocal. So it ends up in the denominator. Uh, but what does x to the 2 thirds power mean? That means we're going to take x, we're going to square it, and then we're going to take the cube root of the whole thing. Okay, uh, So we'll need to have that in mind as we now try to do f prime of negative 1. Okay, so let's see here. We got uh, 1 divided by 3 times the quantity negative 1 to the 2 thirds power. When I square negative 1, I get positive 1. When I take the cube root of positive 1, I get positive 1. So this is just equal to 1 third. Boom. Okay, so now if you want to have a little more fun, go ahead and flip over the back side of the paper, and we'll look at this uh, four pepper limit problem. I believe this is from an old AP exam. Uh, so let's go ahead and take a look at this one. I got graphs of F and G. Uh, both graphs um, have a discontinuity in them. But both graphs are also defined for all the numbers shown from to the left of negative 1 to the right of 3 uh, in terms of what I can see graphically. Okay, so uh, let's go ahead and take a look here. The graphs of functions f and g are shown. Which statement is false? Okay, which statement is false means that 3 are true, 1 is false. Okay, and notice there's... Uh, four answer choices here. The AP calculus exam has four answer choices and has for a couple years now. Uh, the reason for that is because they often found that a fifth distractor answer was hard to come up with and didn't necessarily change scores that much. So there's only four uh, answer choices now. So let's go through them one piece at a time. Uh, and uh, the first one says the limit as x approaches 1 of f of x equals 0. Uh, good limit review here because I can certainly see uh, that if I'm on this graph, as I'm approaching x equals 1, yep, sure enough, that limit is 0. I, I don't really care that the function is defined at x equals 1 as 2. That doesn't matter when we're evaluating limits. So I'm going to go ahead and say that this one gets a big green check. It's true. Now let's look at part B. The limit of g of x as x approaches 2 does not exist. Well, let's see what happens as we approach x equals 2 on the graph of g. Now, from the left-hand side, the left-hand limit there is equal to positive 1. The right-hand limit is equal to negative 1, and that's a problem. Uh, we know from our study of limits that you have to approach the same value from the left and the right. So that is true. That limit does not exist. Okay, so now we got a 50-50 sh shot at getting this question right. Uh, let's go ahead and 
Uh, I'm actually going to just tell you now what the right answer is. The right answer is C. That limit doesn't exist, but let's go and look at part D first to see if that might help us. Uh, and, and you'll notice here in this problem, we have transformed functions, g of x plus 1, f of x plus 1. And let's talk about what those transformations actually mean. Those transformations are a left shift of one unit on the original function. Okay, so it's a left shift of one unit on the original function. Okay, so there's this rule in limits that says, uh, and let's just take a quick look here. We've got uh, the limit of a product, limit of a product. And, and the rule says that the limit of a product is the product of the limits if both limits exist. Okay, so let's take a look at this first one. Uh, the limit as x approaches 1 of f of x plus 1. Well, that I can rewrite that. If this graph is a left shift of one, one unit, that would be the limit as x approaches 2. Why? Because if you substitute in uh, x equals 1, f of 1 plus 1 is f of 2. Okay, so that's the limit um, as x approaches 2 of f of x. Okay, and now let's take a look at the limit as x approaches 1 of g of x. So I want to see if both of these limits exist. If they both do, then I could multiply them to actually find out what the limit of this uh, product is. Okay, so let's take a look back at the graph. The limit as x approaches 2 on the graph of f. Well, that's right here somewhere. The graph's continuous. So, uh, you know, that's, I don't know exactly what that is, but let's, you know, say it's about negative 1.2, something like that. I'm just, you know, I, it's definitely a value. I don't know exactly what it is, but I don't really need to know it because I'm not, I don't have to evaluate the limit. I just have to show that it exists. Uh, and the next one, the limit as x approaches 1 of g of x. The limit as x approaches 1 of g of x. Well, that's w just 1, right? That's uh, a point on the graph, and it's continuous around uh, x equals 1. So this, this one right here was about, did I put negative on the graph? Yeah, about negative 1.2. And that one was 1. So the limit of a product is the product of the limits if both limits exist. This one exists, and this one exists, okay? So that means this is true. So I'm going to give it a green check. I'm, again, I'm not asked to evaluate the limit. I'm just asked to see whether or not it's true. Okay, now let's look at part C and show why C is the false statement uh, in this problem. So I'm going to whip down here. Uh, we got the limit as x approaches 1. And, and what I'm going to do here, uh, two different strategies. Um, I'm going to look at first... Let's look at this. The limit as x approaches um, 2 of g of x. Why am I doing that? Because g of x plus 1 as x approaches 1 is the same as the limit as x approaches 2 of g of x. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at the graph. Well, clearly there's a problem. Uh, if we use our little you know, limit viewing tool, yep, I see we're not approaching the same value on so both sides of that. Uh, so that does not exist. So the limit of g of x as x approaches 2 does not exist. We already know that. I just wasted a couple minutes of your time. We already know that because we looked at that above. Okay. Uh, so that means I can't use the rule that I did in part D where I just said, yep, the limit of the product is the product of the limits. So I need to abandon that strategy and I'm going to start considering one-sided limits. Okay. So let's look at the one-sided limit as x approaches 1 from the left. And again, this is f of x plus g of x plus 1. That's going to be equal to the limit as x approaches 1 from the left of f of x times the limit as x approaches 2 from the left of g of x. Why 2? Because I'm taking out that transformation. So let's take a look and see what we get there. The limit as x approaches 1 from the left. Well, that's easy. It's 0. I can see that we already, we already evaluated that in part A. Okay, so this is 0. And let's take a look at this one. The limit of g of x as x approaches 2 from the left. As x approaches 2 from the left, 
I'm on this top part of the graph and I approach a value of positive one. Okay, so this is equal to positive one. And zero times positive one is equal to zero. Okay, so that's the left-hand sided limit. Now, in order for this limit to exist as x approaches one, the left and right, right hand sides have to be the same. So let's do the same idea that one sided limit f of x times g of x plus one. So we're going to look at the limit as x approaches one now from the right of f of x times the limit as x approaches two from the right of g of x. Okay, and let's see what we have now. Uh, so that limit of f of x as x approaches 1, we already know that's 0. And for g of x as x approaches 2 from the right, well now I'm on the bottom part of this graph. And I'm approaching 1, but it's negative 1. Okay, so that's going to change this piece right here. Okay, uh, and I can certainly multiply these two numbers. Uh, 0 times negative 1 is still equal to 0. And here's the moral of the story. If the left-hand side limit and the right-hand side limit are equal, then the limit exists, and that limit is zero. So that's why DNE is false, okay? It, it's not DNE. It's actually zero. Okay, uh, there's another strategy uh, for solving this one that's graphical, and I'll just share with you a, a student uh, in my third period class talked about this one, and I couldn't argue with it. It was great. Uh, they, they made this statement. They said, well, we know as x approaches 1 on f of x, that's the same as x approaching 2 on g of x plus 1. And here, the function is positive. So if I multiply positive 1 times f of x, I'm going to get, well, that's a little bit thicker than I had hoped for. Let me let me try to dial that back a second, folks. That was a little bit extreme. Let's try that one. Okay. So if I multiply the left-hand side of this, okay, that's still ridiculous. Let's try that. If I multiply the left-hand side by positive 1, it's going to look like that. Now the right-hand side of the graph is times negative 1. And we know what multiplying by a negative does. It flips the graph on the other side of the axis, of the x-axis. So if you look at that graph, and we use our special limit viewing tool, as x approaches 1, both sides of that graph approach 0. So that, I thought, was a very unique strategy. It's certainly um, less analytical than what I talked about, and I mean less algebra, uh, but it also works. So hope that's helpful to you. Take care. Happy trails. Bass out.